Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before we get started, I want to thank Jared Jenish and Megan Coleman for making this event possible. The Howe Library is a fantastic community space, and I feel so lucky that we have Jared and Megan at the helm of our events. Tonight we have Brian Michael Murphy with us talking about his new book, We the Dead, Preserving Data at the End of the World. Brian Michael Murphy earned a PhD in Comparative Studies from The Ohio State University, where he was a Presidential Fellow. His work has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Vermont Arts Council, and the Ohio Arts Council. Murphy is the managing and nonfiction editor of Northwest Review. He is co-editor of a special issue of Media and titled Afterlives of Data, and a founding board member of Outpost, a residency for creative writers of color from the United States and Latin America. His recent publications include an essay on the digitization of lynching images in the edited volume, The Expanded Field of Conservation, and a short story published as liner notes for spectacular diagnostics album, Ancient Methods, on the Amsterdam-based label, Rucksack Records. Prior to becoming a professor, he co-produced and released two hip-hop albums, Manifest Destiny in 2006 and Black Fire in 2008. These are both available on Apple Music, and I highly suggest you give them a listen. Brian Michael Murphy is Dean of the College at Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont. That's where I had the good luck to cross paths with him, and I'm so excited to welcome him here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Brian Michael Murphy. Thanks so much, Rena. And thank you all for coming out. Just start a timer to make sure I stay on track. Um, it's really nice to meet all of you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Now I will have a bit of a uh, slideshow later so you can see some visuals of some things that I mentioned. So, um, I'm gonna read from the introduction of We the Dead um, and take you on a trip with me little adventure that I had while I was doing research for this book. And the introduction is called, I Will Survive. I'm just here to look at some old photos. I slide my driver's license onto the silver tray below the bulletproof glass, then to a gun-hipped guard, a row of six assault rifles on the wall behind her. She keeps my ID and passes me a security badge saying, Clip this to your shirt, return to your car, someone will drive out in a few minutes. Follow them in. I walk back to my rented car and sit, stare straight ahead to where the road leads directly into and under a small mountain. Soon enough, I see a red car emerge from the tunnel. Its driver waves at me, pulls a U-turn. I follow her to the security checkpoint. Now, there'll be moments where I'm just gonna kind of pause the reading and just talk here a little bit. Uh, because it was really, really strange to go to this facility and see someone who just came out of it, this highly securitized facility, and even though they just came out of it, they have to have their car searched again before they go back in. Um, so it's a very, very intense place. The Kevlar clad security guard gives the trunk of my car and the back seat a cursory search, asking whether I have explosives or weapons. He's quite genial almost cheering, even though there's a cube of chain link fencing enclosing us. You're going to Corbis today, huh? He asks as he pops open my glove box. Yes, I reply. What an interesting place, huh? It's amazing they have all those old photos down there, isn't it? Yes, it's amazing. Are you doing some research or? Yes, I'm writing a book. That's great. That's great. Have a great day. You're going to love it down there. Thanks. He waves me through, slaps a button that raises the wall of fence in front of me, and then lays down flat a row of yellow steel spikes on the road ahead. I then wait for a green light to raise yet another security gate protecting the entrance to Iron Mountains National Data Center in Boyers, Pennsylvania. Formerly a limestone mine, the site was converted into a secure records and data storage facility in the Cold War. Now it consists of roughly 150 underground acres of vaults filled with ordered avalanches of paper, miles of microfilm, and digital servers forming a part of what we collectively and inaccurately refer to as a cloud. 
for the data we preserve around the clock doesn't live in the sky. It is a place on the ground and underground. And at Iron Mountain, one of over 2,600 data centers in the United States alone, the entrance to the cloud is what military strategists call a choke point, a stone archway wide enough for only a single vehicle to pass through, easy to barricade, difficult to penetrate, and one of the reasons this place has a security rating of four. To put that in perspective, the White House and the Pentagon are rated five. So, pretty securitized. I have come here to do research at the Corbis Film Preservation Facility. Created by Microsoft founder Bill Gates for his image resource company, Corbis, the CFF, I'll call it for you know, facility's sake. Uh, the CFF is one of many vaults in Iron Mountain. It contains a 10,000 square foot refrigerated vault located 220 feet underground in a limestone cavern where Gates stores his collection of 20 million photographs. Corbis makes money by licensing images for use in commercials, greeting cards, magazine ads, documentaries, websites, book covers, and anywhere else images are deployed in the pursuit of revenue. Though journalists or documentarians like Ken Burns or his assistants have visited the CFF often, the facility is notoriously difficult for academics to access. I sent emails and made calls to whoever I could find on the Corbis website over and over for about three years. I'd basically given up when I received an email from Ann Hartman, the manager of the CFF. I am not sure how or why I got in. But the fact that academics have a hard time accessing the CFF makes sense because the richest man in the world built it not for research purposes, but for profit. Corbis began as Interactive Home Systems, founded by Gates in 1989. He imagined that people in the digital age would eventually have wall screens in their homes. You know, like Fahrenheit, if you've read Fahrenheit 451, their walls are screens. Like Bill Gates thought, okay, so if we all have wall screens, people are going to want to decorate their walls. What do people put on their walls? art, but it's not going to be a physical painting. It's going to be a digital image of a painting. So if I buy up all the rights, the digital rights to all the art now in the early 80s, by the time people are decorating their wall screens with digital art, I'll make a fortune. He didn't know that the images were actually going to get smaller and the screens would get smaller and that would be the thing. But anyway, this was his prediction. So at that time, he began buying massive amounts of art and numerous image archives. He snapped up the digital rights to art in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the National Gallery in London, long before most museums, artists, and lawyers even knew what digital rights were. He bought one of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, known as the Codex Leicester, not to mention the digital rights to all of Ansel Adams' photographs, and some of the most important photography archives in existence. Gates' acquisitions included the Bettman Archive, which contains over 10 million photos and illustrations, the entire United Press International Archive, and iconic photos like Albert Einstein sticking out his tongue and Marilyn Monroe having trouble with her skirt on a Manhattan sidewalk, and a row of construction workers perched on a steel beam floating 50 stories above the out-of-focus metropolis. The originals of these highly valuable photos are actually stored in a special deep freezer in the CFF, at negative four degrees Fahrenheit. According to Henry Wilhelm, designer of the CFF and the leading expert in the field of image permanence, the refrigerated humidity controlled vault will effectively preserve the photographs and film in it for 10,000 to 15,000 years. And this is where the book started because when I read that, and it was over a decade ago, I thought to myself, why would anyone want to preserve anything for 10,000 to 15,000 years? Where does that desire come from? These are not the first people to do it, but when do we start thinking this way? So here I am on my way to Corvus. I'm very, very excited. The excitement is building. I pass through the choke point, and it's really, really tough because you can only drive like 10 miles per hour down there. Most people are on golf carts, so they're kind of zooming past me and I'm in my car like, I can't wait to get in there, I can't wait to get in there. Park my car just outside the CFF, and there an Iron Mountain representative named Debbie greets me and offers to give me a guided tour of the larger facility. So I'm like, I don't want to go in, but she's going to show me around. So I get on the golf cart and I take the tour. 
this underground city of vaults and offices has its own fire department. There are the trucks, she points out as we speed past four bright red fire engines. In addition to in-house emergency services, Iron Mountain has the backup supplies of any respectable doomsday bunker. The 2,000 people who worked underground in Iron Mountain could survive for months under a total lockdown without any contact or reinforcements from the world above. We ride past a set of doors with a Warner Brothers sign beside them. That's where the studio stores original masters of its classic films, Debbie says. And she kind of has to yell because you're like in a cave and you're on a golf cart and there's a bunch of wind. So um, Debbie's always going to be yelling when I do Debbie's voice. Okay. Um, she yells, <laughs> E.T., Back to the Future, Jaws, they're all inside that vault. Just around the corner is an unmarked vault. There are a bunch of unmarked ones, and most of them I'm not allowed to tell you what's in there. But in that one, she points to a set of black doors, are all of the original reels of Steven Spielberg's interviews with Holocaust survivors. He's one of our private clients. I learned that all of the original records of the U.S. Patent Office are somewhere down here as well as the black box from United Airlines Flight 93 and numerous other artifacts in rooms without signs over the doors, their contents classified. As I ride the golf cart with Debbie, I flash back to being five years old, watching the last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark on Betamax. If you know what Betamax is, you're my people. <laughs> now I'm speeding on a golf cart through a real life version of that warehouse where they stored the Ark of the Covenant as the credits roll. A fictional warehouse like this one, is an almost boundless archive of materials, some of them secret, that we painstakingly preserve and protect. Materials that exist in a kind of necessary oblivion just below the surface of everyday life. And like the Ark of the Covenant, we attribute to these materials a kind of supernatural power and treat them with, rever with reverence. Only a select few can approach them or touch them on pain of death. We ride past an office where herds of workers are returning from their lunch break. The facade of the cubicle space is plain with a sign that reads rather benignly, U.S. Office of Personnel Management. But this office is one of the main reasons for the doomsday security measures of the facility as it houses all of the records from security clearance proceedings. We check out another vault, this one tidy and endless and just as cold. We open up a box of microfilm backups of nationwide insurance policies. Are these old? I ask. Why are they on microfilm? She smiles, replying, no, they're not old. These boxes just arrived. Just arrived. Microfilm is still the archival standard for permanent records. Digital files often aren't considered permanent, so a lot of corporations and government agencies still keep backups on microfilm. For certain kinds of records, you have to by law. As if to drive the point home, Debbie takes me down the road to a media lab where old paper files are being digitized. But in the other half of the lab, technicians in white coats are creating microfilm copies of PDFs. It's the blatant reverse of what popular culture and ads for digital technology tell us, namely that we make progress by shifting to new data formats. But in that moment in the digitization and microfilming lab, I realized the media history is like all of history, a cycle, a whirlwind of human successes and failures, much more disparate and haywire than any story we tend to tell about it. She then drops me off at a music and media production studio. Still with me? You with me? All right. She drops me off at a music and media production studio. The rooms of the studio have the same cave walls as the other vaults, but they have been painted a shimmering silver like something out of a 1960s sci-fi sci flick set in the 90s. Uh, apparently, at some point, some decision maker at Iron Mountain got the bright idea. I was like, wait a second. It's underground. It's cold. And there's not a lot of light. But if we painted the walls a reflective color, it would like give us twice the light and warmth. And like, light doesn't work that way, I don't think. So anyway, they painted like this one room silver, and then they gave up. Uh, so anyway, I go in this silver cave, and um, in there, they have every type of surviving media playback machine in the world. So you have an old Edison wax cylinder you want to hear, or a two-inch quadruplex videotape reel of news footage from the 1960s you need to digitize, or a nitrate film documentary from the 30s. 
these studio technicians can pull up the sound or the images for you. Uh, if they can be pulled up, because there are, of course, horror stories of master recordings that have deteriorated or won't play. And in some cases, it's actually about the newer media, not the older ones. So like they were talking, telling me a story about trying to um, remaster a Kanye West recording, which could have been more than 10 years old, but the hard drive had something had failed inside and it wouldn't spin. So they're like, eh, can't get to that stuff. Um, beyond the work of contemporary artists like Kanye West, um, Iron Mountain houses some of the most valuable recordings in history, including master tapes of Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley. Um, and as my guide through the studio tells stories of coaxing sound out of fragile artifacts, the studio engineer, who looks like Dana Carvey's guards from Wayne's World, interrupts to inform me that I am standing in the same room with the original recording of Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. You know the disco classic? You know it. You know you know it. He's running these tracks into the sound editing software Pro Tools for a disco version of Guitar Hero. He's like, I bet you never noticed this super funky guitar underneath everything else. He says to me, he presses a couple buttons, and suddenly all the tracks drop out except the guitar. And he's right, I had not noticed it before. And it is indeed super funky. <laughs> now, only later would I notice how strange and haunting it was that the recorded voice of Gaynor was shouting the phrase, I will survive, even as it underwent preservation like a protest against the decay and inevitable entry into oblivion that ultimately awaits even the most guarded of human artifacts. The pleading in the voice is both adamant and vulnerable, reminding us that one can desperately seek survival, but survival can never be guaranteed. Outside, Debbie is waiting on the golf cart. How'd it go? She shouts over the sound of air compressors and jackhammers. Very interesting, I reply at the top of my voice. Workers in yellow suits are perched on mechanical scaffolds across the road, widening one of the limestone caverns to make space for another storage space, her office. Let's get you over to Corvus, she says, cranks the golf cart to full speed. Finally, I reach my destination. I am here to see as many images as I can, but I am mostly interested in the Bettman archive. Bill Gates bought the Bettman for an undisclosed sum in 1995. And at the time, it was stored in a New York City office that was too hot and too humid to preserve the collection. He originally planned to digitize it, but soon found out just how much time digitization takes. After the first 100,000 images, it was apparent that by the time half of the overall archive was digitized, many items would have deteriorated beyond recognition, breaking down in a process that archivists call the vinegar syndrome, where the chemicals and film negatives release gases that smell like vinegar as they decompose. Gates decided to separate the most important and valuable images, which the Corvus archivists referred to as the very important photographs. Get it? VIPs? And placed them in the deep freezer at negative four Fahrenheit. To digitize them, the pictures first have to be thawed in a process that takes hours, as they have to be moved to progressively warmer temperatures to avoid condensation on their surfaces that would cause irreparable damage. Now, the rest of the images are stored in a larger vault, which is at 30 degrees. And though that's not quite as cold, the archivists still keep a coat rack of parkas by the door to the vault and put one on each time a client requests an image, whether of Holly Golightly smoking a cigarette or of Kim Fook, the napalm girl, running naked, screaming down Vietnam's Highway 1. As I step into the giant vault and look down the long rows of filing cabinets filled with tens of millions of photographs, I wonder, yet again, how did Americans become so obsessed with trying to save photos, paper documents, sound recordings, moving images, and digital files? How did we become obsessed with saving them forever? I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some theories on why we're so obsessed with preserving things. Um, and then I'll show you a few of the examples or the case studies that I look at in the, in the body of the book. And then we'll move on to some questions in just a few more minutes. In his essay, The Ontology of the Photographic Image, pioneering French film critic André Bazin offered the most compelling universal theory on what motivates humans to preserve data. Bazin died at the untimely age of 40, and his theory of preservation is not only that, it is also a meditation on mortality and the fleetingness of life. 
according to Bazin, who was writing this theory in the wake of World War II, humans attempt to ward off time and death by preserving images of themselves that will outlive their physical bodies. At the center of all this human creativity is a mummy complex. That was his name for it, the mummy complex. Universal and transhistorical, practiced in all cultures and at all times, the psychic structure finds expression in all the plastic arts, from painting to sculpture, from death masks and taxidermy to photography and cinema, not to mention ancient Egyptians' mummification of the dead, hence the mummy complex. Yet Bazan could never really explain why preservation practices are so intensive in some cultures and not in others, nor did he have an answer for why the scale and technological sophistication of preservation increases at one moment in history as opposed to another. And I wanted to understand why it is the United States preserves so intensive, to give you an example. The United States is home to nearly 2,700 data centers. If you take the countries that are number two, number three, number four, number five, and combine them, the United States still has more. When we preserve, Bazan says, we manifest in our mummy complex and tell ourselves that no matter what happens in this uncertain world, that no matter who is left alive when a war economic meltdown concludes, a trace of us will remain. This is the technological afterlife we seek, not unlike the Egyptians who preserved the heart, liver, and lungs of the dead in earthen jars so that they could be used in the afterlife. But unlike the ancient Egyptians, we have made such extensive preservation necessary not only for the afterlife, but also for our earthly life, as our financial lives, social lives, love lives, and all major economic and governmental institutions in our country rely on digital infrastructure to record, preserve, and redistribute the data that underwrites our everyday life. The Egyptians did not do this, so why did we? We the Dead, this book that I've written, makes the case the mummy complex has mutated. We have perceived success in our preservation efforts so often that we have made a way of life out of it. We Americans, we the Dead, now have a new condition I call the data complex. The data complex is both material out there in our libraries, archives, data centers, bomb-proof bunkers, and psychological inside us, in our minds, where we fear the progressions of time and decay, and place our faith in the bulwarks and technological magic of the cloud. Emerging in the early 20th century and developing and expanding through a series of crises, the data complex preserved more and more data about us and promised us security and a kind of data-based immortality long desired by the money, mummy complex. But now the data complex has become so vast, so automated by algorithms, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, that it has moved beyond preserving data about and for its human creators. The data complex now exists ultimately to preserve data for its own sake. The data complex's main purpose is to preserve itself. The data complex by design outlives the humans who imagine and build it, and in it we have ended up preserving something other than just traces of our appearance on Earth, our thoughts, our activities, and vital statistics. In the storage spaces, media technologies, and infrastructures that preserve and distribute data, the hopes and fears of previous generations took on physical form. For instance, during the Cold War, bomb-proof bunkers embodied both the fear of nuclear annihilation and the hope that Americans could survive it. Through our own acts of preservation, our hopes and fears too become real and thus form part of the actual patrimony we pass on, if unwittingly, to the humans of the future. With its imposing facades and securitized facilities outfitted with surveillance cameras, steel gates, traffic spikes, and armed guards, the data complex is a paradox. On the one hand, these fortifications are forbidding they repel any and all threats to the precious data of the past and present. On the other, they are welcoming. They invite future generations to deposit their data bodies too in the inner sancta, where perhaps one day archeologists will eventually break in. And as they catalog the contents of an underground bank vault repurposed to preserve old Hollywood movies, won't these archeologists of the future wonder for what kind of society did these strange wheels of film serve as currency? What could one buy with these thin strips filled with black and gray ghosts? So I wanna share a few images and then I'll stop talking and we'll do some questions. Um, so 
Let's cover the book, what you've seen. This is the choke point that I mentioned. I, I stepped aside, but you can see it, but you can see it. <laughs> um, at the Iron Mountain National Data Center in Boyers. Um, you're not allowed to take any photos. I had to pull this from the internet because I wasn't allowed to take any photos and be outside of the facility. I wasn't allowed to take any photos inside the facility except within the Corvus office. And um, when I did research in there, if I had to go to the bathroom, uh, one of the archivists had to walk with me to the bathroom and wait outside while I went to the bathroom. And then when I came out, they would walk me back to the Corvus office. I'm not allowed to explore on my own at all. And that's not just because I'm an untrustworthy person. That is the protocol for everyone who goes down there, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, this is inside the Corvus vault. This is the 10,000 square foot freezer where most of the images are stored. Um, Besides the VIPs. Uh, and it isn't just photographs, and they're all newspapers. There's a lot of, of course, photographs of metadata. There are very quirky and um, idiosyncratic card catalogs and like organization systems that don't correspond to organization systems anywhere else that these archivists came up with over time. One of which um, nobody can use because they laid off the only guy who understood it. Um, this is another vault. Um, where all the HBO's master recordings are, everything HBO's ever produced, all their masters are stored down there, cold storage. This is from the, the media lab I told you about, where the Wayne's World guy was, all the old machines. This is the actual office, this is where I finally made it in. That was the desk where I worked, and there are all these, as I said, these really like <laughs> layers of binders that don't really match up because the company, uh, the Batman Archive traded hands a few times, so a lot of overlapping systems. That's the card catalog that um, doesn't work anymore, but it's really cool. It's got like all these really interesting um, subject headings and there actually are literal analog like thumbprint photos that they printed out really small and like cut with scissors and like glued to each index card. Um, this is, I didn't talk about this in the talk, but it's in the chapter. This is an underground lake um, down at the bottom of the former mine and they uh, pump the cold water from the lake through the um, pipes in the server rooms to absorb the heat. Um, and then they return it to the other end of the lake and they pump it through. So that's how they, they do cooling of the server rooms down there. They had to reverse engineer a bunch of stuff because they're underground. So like the toilets have to flush up and all these other things they had to figure out. Um, so I talked about the data complex beginning in the United States. Um, it really gets going in the 1920s and 30s is the first scientific studies by the U.S. government about what causes paper and microfilm to decay. The first time it was scientifically established what the causes were. And these chemists were really excited about it and they wrote in exciting journals like Vital Statistics Special Reports, which I'm sure we've all read, uh, which raises the question of like, how did this actually reach the American populace? Well, some of the people that got excited about this were librarians. This is Thomas Himes, uh, who actually corresponded with these chemists. He was at the Huntington Library. Um, this is him gassing. Um, some rare books with poison gas to kill bookworms, which is another important element of the origins of the data complex and toxicity and other things I talk about in the book. Um, but the people that got really, really excited were the first permanent time capsule creators. These were the first people who decided that they were going to preserve paper and microfilm for over 5,000 years. So they wanted to accomplish something in terms of preservation that rivaled the ancients, but they wanted to do it with modern media. So this is the Westinghouse time capsule cupeloid deposited in 1939 at the New York World's Fair. Um, this is the typical American family because there are all these connections with um, concerns about the white race being contaminated and the record they wanted to record was a pure American cultural record. Um, and they wanted to transmit that to their descendants in the future. And literally at the dedication ceremony, the chair of the Westinghouse board is saying like, the people who opened this in the year 6939 will be supermen by our standards. This will be a world that is more fit. The abnormal will have no place in it. It was basically, you know, not even veiled eugenicist rhetoric. Um, and so this family was actually, they were winners of a typical American family contest that was held at the fair, um, which goes back to eugenics exhibits um, and earlier 20th century um, public affairs. Uh, another important person that I talk about a good deal in the book, um, concurrently with the Westinghouse time capsule, and this idea was actually kind of, Westinghouse stole it from this guy. Um, this is Thornwell Jacobs, who 
who's the president, who was the president of Oglethorpe University just outside of Atlanta. And he created what he called the Crypt of Civilization, meant to be open in the year 8113. Um, and uh, again, it was supposed to preserve a record of humankind's knowledge and achievements up to the year 1936. And uh, this is actually a metal film that they created to back up the um, film as you and I know it. Um, he hired this guy, T.K. Peters, who had invented metal film. It works by reflection instead of projecting through it. Um, so it actually, the images are etched in nickel. It's a fragment I found in the Library of Congress. Um, this is T.K. Peters, who invented metal film, who was an avid yoga practitioner and believed in reincarnation and said that in the year 8113, he would make sure that he came back to life by the time so that he could explain the crypt to the people who were going to open it. He was very serious. Um, and this is also, this gets more into the Cold War era um, of the book where um, there was, if you've seen the represent the photos of the um, mannequins being um, hit with atomic bombs, um, there were also secret tests being done. Well, that was the public facing one. One of the secret ones was um, they were testing the ability of filing cabinets and safes to preserve data. So they, would, they dropped atomic bombs on these poor filing cabinets, as you can see, the, a couple of them didn't make it. And they even had like fake stock certificates and like uh, bearer bonds for companies that didn't exist um, that they put in there to test how, how well they would fare. Um, more of Cold War stuff. I went to a fallout, fallout shelter for Congress that was built but never used in West Virginia. This is a project where uh, Trevor Paglin micro etched 100 images and sent it into outer space on a satellite, um, which he says will still be there in the Earth. It's like swallowed by the sun. Um, so getting into the deep time of it. But anyway, the book goes a lot of different places. I'll stop there because I've talked I think, longer than I was supposed to. And I'll take some questions. Thank you, though. Great. That was so great. Um, thank you so much for crossing state lines to be with us in New Hampshire tonight. I have some questions, um, but also if, you know, if something that I'm saying kind of piques your interest, you can kind of hop on and add to the question. And if you're participating over Zoom, I think just put your questions right into the Zoom chat and Jared will read them out to us. So my first question is about popular notions of data. How are we thinking about data and how should we be thinking about data? Um, for the purposes of this conversation, can you start us off with like a working definition of the word data? Sure. Um, so in terms of the popular conception, there, there are a few different things going on. Um, I referenced the metaphor of the cloud. So one of the ways that in popular culture, um, people tend to think about data as something that is immaterial it's not material um, and I in my definition of data my working definition of data uh, data is always material um, always necessarily material. it's not free floating it's not like just kind of out there in the ether waiting to be captured it's always material uh, more specifically what I would say is that um, data is legible recordable communicable units of information um, that is authorized by an institution of power um, not everything is data, not everything that I say counts as data. Like data has to be generated um, and it has to be framed as something that registers as legitimate information. So that's, that's my working definition. It's, uh, it's, it's particular, uh, not everybody would share it, but um, that's where I'm coming from. And there's, there's more to it than that. I mean, we talk about like datification as a process. Um, there are ways in which data is being conceptualized now as a, as a kind of natural resource. And um, people are saying things like data is the new oil, uh, which maps onto a lot of really, um, really problematic imaginaries around extraction and people not having to get consent or recognize um, that, you know, data, that data may actually belong to somebody else. It's just sort of framed in these really colonial imaginaries of like, oh, there's valuable stuff out there, let's go get it however we can. Right. So I mean, what about like data is the new cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that It has one. a bad impact on our health. Oh, interesting. Interesting. That, I like that better than data is the new one. <laughs> I, I hadn't really heard people say that. I was just thinking about okay. it. Um, well, that's a t-shirt. No, that's good. 
<laughs> you write, acts of preservation always change that which they preserve, that which they promise to keep the same. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about this preservation paradox? Sure. Well, I, um, I started really thinking hard about preservation when I was doing my master's thesis, and uh, I wrote about a human that had been taxidermically preserved oh. uh, and displayed in a museum in Spain from, from 1916 to 1997. And uh, so that made me a little suspicious about preservation. Um, and then I started studying taxidermy, what actually happens. You know, most of the human material is gone by the time it's, or animal specimen, whatever it is, right? And there's all of this underlying structure, this wood, and depending on the time when it's created, these other materials that are, that are put in there. Um, and you have to literally toxify the material, right? You have to soak it in arsenic or make, make it toxic in some way so that the microbes that you and the insects that usually constitute will be called decay. If they try to eat it, they die, right? So I started looking at the toxicity of preservation, started looking at how things are changed by it and reading about Egyptian archaeology, so many things that we see in a museum were actually, you know, reconstituted, right? So there's like all of this glue and adhesive involved, or they're reconstructed. Um, when you get to the example like digitization, um, obviously you have the addition of massive amounts of metadata. Uh, when that happens, obviously a digital image materially is quite different from the photo that is printed on paper. So, you know, the preservation of an analog image on paper by digitizing it is creating something new, right? Um, it's expending energy, um, not to mention the fact that when it enters into a database like these Bettman archive images, um, it pr there's a proliferation of new contents through the metadata and the tags that are attached to it. So, um, and also in a, in, a, in a more basic way, these time capsule creators they were literally inventing new preservation techniques because they wanted to preserve. So before they'd actually even preserved the thing, preservation was already generating something new, right? And it was also generating not just new techniques, new materials, they literally invented a new metal alloy for the shell of the time capsule. It was inventing new ways of seeing, new ways of imagining the future, our relationship to people in the past, et cetera. Um, and then in a more basic example, like. I didn't read it, but in the introduction, when they took me into the media lab, they were uh, there was a photo of Eleanor Roosevelt standing before a podium that one of Corbis clients had requested, and they removed a podium to make the photo more balanced. And I was like, "Can you do that?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, this, this is standard procedure. This is what we do. We just change it if it will make it look better." <laughs> so, <laughs> so literally, you know, they are changing what they're preserving. So you write that every emergent data format that becomes dominant does so as it corresponds to and grows materially out of the prevailing economic mode of production, whether agrarian, industrial, or informational. Can you just break that down a little bit, situate us in these three modes with regard to data? Sure. So I think I said that in a part of the book where I was thinking about an emerging data format which right now is DNA data storage. So um, scientists figured out how to, <clears throat> either in synthetic DNA or actually like living microorganisms, um, basically map binary code onto the, the basic ATCG of DNA and you can store any digital data there and retrieve it. You need a computer to do it. But I was like, you know, is this ever going to scale? Is this ever going to be like a dominant data format? And when you look back at history, um, you see that there are these, I mean, one way to think about economies is in these modes, right? Agrarian, like agriculturally based, industrial, and then sort of where we are now, this post-industrial economy, if you will, where, you know, the United States economy since the 70s and 80s has increasingly um, been founded in finance, the manipulation of data and information, circulation of information. So um, if you look at a specific, a specific data format, like um, microfilm, for instance, right? You need, you need a chemical industry, right? Uh, which is really based in a mining industry of an industrial scale to provide the kind of natural resources that make that possible. Com computation obviously goes back way further than the internet, right? Um, but we don't say that the digital age started with punch card machines or the Jacquard loom in 1804, right? The digital age starts in the late 
20th century. Well, it corresponds to the shift in the United States where we were no longer this industrial powerhouse. We had shifted into making a bunch of money on things like finance, insurance, you know, always these various industries that are based on that. So, um, so to, to break that down, uh, the question about whether DNA will ever eclipse or displace or sort of enter into a dominant position in relation to our current digital technologies, um, it's going to depend on whether some of the some of the things that are happening in the biotechnological realm um, actually scale to sort of support that, um, because otherwise uh, it's going to be a kind of marginal, really expensive and slow technology. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the hardest things for me to wrap my mind around are the ties between data preservation and eugenics, particularly as you discuss them in chapter two. At what point in your research did you first realize this connection, or did you go into the book with some understanding that this was that this was happening, and that you want to write about this? I think the um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, I think we're at first happened with two places. Um, one is a, is a really amazing scholar named Nick Yablin, who's at um, University of Iowa, and he just wrote the book on time capsules called The Remembrance of Things Present. And he had written an article about the prehistory of time capsules, so like the 1876 centennial safe. There's all this like class uh, conflict going on, and there were some wealthy folks um, who wanted to preserve a record for the people of the future. Um, and there were some other ones going on at the time. And one of the things that he noted was there were some folks in Colorado who put together these composite images called like 12 ladies from Colorado Springs. And they had borrowed this technique from Francis Galton, who of course coined the term eugenics um, and was Charles, Dar Charles Darwin's cousin. Um, so he noted this linkage between like them sort of investing this eugenic hope that people in the future would sort of conform to this ideal, this physical ideal that was coming out of physiognomy and some of these other kind of like, some of these like pseudoscientific things that were going on at the time. So anyway, Nick Yablin, he, he, he pointed that out. Um, that was one place. But then as I started doing research on Corbis and the Batman archive in particular, there was a time, and now Corbis has been gobbled up by, by another um, investment group, but there was a time when you could search in the Batman archive in the Corbis database, and when you'd search preservation, there were all these images that you might expect, you know, scenes from Egypt, um, food preservation, like food canning and things like that. Uh, a soldier being embalmed by Thomas Holmes in the Civil War, which you don't necessarily think of as next to food, but it is all preservation technology. But then there was a there was a title page from a first edition of Charles Darwin's on the origin of species. And I was like, what does that do in there? Well, apparently, when it was originally published, the subtitle was, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And if you actually read the way it was originally written, and read the text, there are all these moments where reproduction and preservation have this really interesting relationship in terms of inherited traits. I started thinking about reproduction and preservation in terms of digitization, reproducing this thing and making something new, but you're saying you're preserving. Um, and then from there, all you have to do is read some of the diaries, letters, and editorials of Thornwell Jacobs, who created the Pyramid Civilization, and it gets very eugenical very, very quick. So between that, that sort of put me on that path of thinking about it. Um, but again, once you once I got into the archives, you know, and I see the chairman of Westinghouse delivering this speech, because this, you know, you, there were people who there were many, many people in the United States who were not necessarily advocating for what's called negative eugenics, which is like what the Nazis did, where you're actually like killing people. You are um, you're doing something that is ab obviously atrocious, but there are people who didn't advocate for that but thought that eugenics, positive eugenics, which is this, what they call the science of selective breeding, improving the race by matching pairs of increasingly fit people results in the higher evolution of the race. There are many, many Americans who believed in that and wanted that to happen. Um, so, and then you look at, like I said, the World's Fair, you've got the typical American family contest. 
this is all rooted in you know research that the eugenics record office was doing fitter family contests go back decades at those world fairs and county fairs and things like that so it was a way of disseminating eugenic eugenical ideas uh through you know the masses um yeah so it's kind of it's kind of all over the place and they even um Thornwell Jacobs, who created Curve Civilization, he actually recorded on a metal record um, a speech to the people of 8113. And that's where I took the title of the book, because he said in that speech, along with talking about how, you know, America was becoming this like mongrel race of mixture, mixed race people ruled by Jews. I'm just quoting him, it's stuff that he said, right? Um, he said, so we the dead out of the distant past salute you in the sunny hours of the future um so that's where i got we the dead from mm. so it's kind of all over the place and there were a lot of concerns about you know in the 1930s you got to remember that american capitalism or the system of free enterprise as they were then calling it was incredibly endangered uh, by socialism fascism they perceived um the great migration of African Americans to urban areas, they perceived that as a threat to the white American family, the average, what they called the average American, which was also an idea that was being constructed at that time for the first time in the 1930s. So part of their sterilization of the literal sterilization of this data, which they did, and they, uh, the, the microfilm inside of the time capsules um, was surrounded in an environment of, of inert gas, like helium. So that you know, it was, it was literally sterile. Nothing, no mold could grow there, no mildew. They were protecting a version of what it meant to be American that was fully white and untouched by the immigrants who were coming in and the culture that they brought. Um, by even like the Southern Europeans, right, who were coming in, like this was all a threat to what they felt actual Americanness was, because actual Americanness was a kind of whiteness that was Anglo-Saxon or Nordic. So we're going to go from that to of another very depressing sort of notion. Um, the U.S. government was staging rehearsals for the end of the world. Um, the development of our national archives are so bound up with war and the military. In a section of the book called Fallout Forecasts, you write of a kind of live action role playing where the participants were playing themselves, but the version of themselves after the long feared nuclear apocalypse had finally come. In one specific and chilling example, you write, orphan children will drink post-apocalyptic hot chocolate to warm themselves. That's pretty scary. Um, my question here is, to what extent are we still doing this? You talked a little bit about the Vivos Cryo Vault in the book, and I guess I'm thinking about how in the current moment, our destruction scenarios have shifted from a nuclear to an environmental apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I'd say that the dominant form of this kind of uh, post-apocalyptic or post-ecocidal um, imaginaries taking place is uh, dreams about going to space. Um, so you have people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk who are saying that, you know, we're going to go to Mars or we're going to go to space. We're going to, um, I mean, there are literally startups with, that have had millions of dollars of funding backing them that are aimed at mining asteroids. Um, several years ago, Goldman Sachs put out a, an, an investment report um, under their profiles and innovation um, titles, it's like 2017, where they're talking about space as a new investment frontier, right? So some of this goes back to the 1890s and Frederick Jackson Turner and the closing of the frontier and immediately people in America start mapping uh, that kind of frontier imaginary onto outer space. and rocketry, the interest in rocketry blows up. Um, I, didn't, I didn't mean to make fun there. I really didn't. Um, but it, it, it increases after that. Um, so the way we're doing this is sort of, um, there are all these ways in which people are imagining the Earth dying and us living on, on other planets or in space, um, somehow, somewhere, possibly, um, as cyborgs, um, the actual term cyborg was coined in a 1960 essay called Cyborgs in Space. Um, and so cyborgs are not actually really about like a human with a machine implant. Cyborgs are really short, it's a portmanteau for a cybernetic organism. 
So the original cyborg concept was all about creating a homeostatic system whereby human and machine were um, in the same circuit so that the space traveler couldn't be bothered, wouldn't be bothered with maintaining the machine to make sure it worked. And they really shouldn't be bothered with maintaining their own body, their own body uh, because they need to be free to think and explore. So the idea was that this cyborg, this circuit, the machine would maintain the human and keep it alive, and the human's homeostatic system would be incorporated, and neural circuitry and all would be incorporated to sort of automate the maintenance of the flying vessel. So space is the is the way that we are sort of imagining surviving all this once it gets too hot. And my final question, because I was hoping to end on a little bit of a happier note. Sure, why not? What data tools are politically healthy? That's a great question. I kind of th I thought about this for a while. Um, I, for as critical as I am of some of these technologies, and for as much as I expose some of the origins, which are uh, distasteful in 2022, of some of this thinking. Um, I don't necessarily think that any of these tools are inherently bad. Um, for instance, I am not on Twitter. I have no intention of ever being on Twitter. That's nothing to do with Elon Musk. I just, I just, it's just not my thing. I've been on it in the past. Um, there are some people who get some amazing work done in terms of organizing, in terms of uh, building community on a platform like Twitter, right? So I think, I think um, many of these things can be harnessed for good. Um, I think you have to be extremely intentional about how you use them. Um, there are, I'm sure, some more radical possibilities in terms of digital tools that I'm just not aware of in, in like, terms of if you really want to be like anonymous, opaque, and still communicate effectively. Like I have a, I have a friend that does research on that. I don't, I don't know that, that realm as well. But, um, but I, I try not to sort of demonize any of these tools because I think that people can do really creative things with them. And I think especially like to end on a really optimistic note, I really do believe that creativity and art are a vital human need. And I think that one of the powerful things that happens through data infrastructure sometimes, digital infrastructure sometimes, is that people connect and build community around, you know, human expression. Um, and I think that that is, that is going to be a key resource or the key resource to our survival um, and our thriving. So um, yeah, whatever you're using, just use it well, be intentional, and um, I think some good things can happen. All right, audience, what questions do you guys have? Is, is there a follow-up question on that, like whether you think there's um, some sort of optimal amount of data infrastructure, uh, for example, for, for encouraging art and creativity, like if at some point there becomes so much preservation that there's very little opportunity for creation, uh, and you know, like if so, then like what the right amount of data infrastructure would be? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. I think, um... I don't have a sense of an, excuse me, maybe that's just the teacher in me. Um, I tend to think that if we can just get a clear view of what the infrastructure is now, of what the cost of it is, of what it takes to maintain it, of some of the myths around it, like, oh, we have to build more. We're running out of space in data centers. We have to build more, which is, of course, very a very convenient line from the companies who build data centers, right? Like, um, there's one trillion what a yada bytes of data being generated every five seconds from a self-driving car. We have, you know, there are all these things that we, we create this sort of false sense of urgency about us needing to expand the infrastructure. So I think we get a clear view of that. And then we need to ask ourselves, like, what do we want? And like, what are the values that should guide the expansion or contraction of this infrastructure? So I think it's about like, I think the optimal is when it matches the values of communities who are actually articulating what it is that they want out of life. What's happening right now is you have a very small group of people um, with a lot of power and a lot of capital who are saying things like, yes, cars, we should have self-driving cars, but, but yes, we should go to space. Yes, we should, um, we should scrape and, and mine and aggregate these massive amounts. Of, we should build AI. 
like that is a value position. That is not an, an obvious natural position to take. That comes out of a very specific history of people wanting that kind of technology to exist. Um, so I think we need to examine our values and what it is that we want. And then the infrastructure, imagine this, would serve <laughs> our wants and our values. What's happening right now is, you know, if we were, if we were a, a B movie in the 1960s, right? And the, and the aliens are scanning planets and they come across Earth in 2022, who are they gonna conclude is the supreme life form on the planet? The data complex. The humans are digging stuff out of the ground. They're working 20 hours a day at Foxconn to build iPhones. Some of them, when people get the iPhones, they're spending their whole day feeding data into it, which is feeding the complex. People are building new data centers so it can get bigger and bigger and larger and larger. It's, it's, it's ruling. I mean, that's what the aliens would conclude. That's a crude analysis, but um, I was raised on sci-fi, so I <laughs> and crude sci-fi at that. Um, so I think we need to match it to our values. I, and I don't want to tell people how to live, but, um, but like I said, the teacher in me is like, okay, that, that's how we want to live. Let's look at what it really means to have 2,700 data centers in one yeah. country. Mm -hmm. Why do we have that? Why do we have so many more than everybody else? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question uh, yeah. about your book cover? Because um, yes. I just think it's so clever. Like the, the lady has a skirt with like the, you know, the file cabinets and there's like data on the guy. So I was wondering like how much input did you get on the on the cover or did they give you ideas first and then you went, oh, that's really great. Or like, please, please, please do not ever have this be my book cover. I had a lot of input. So um, what I did was, I don't know how to do anything on like Photoshop or anything like that. And then I remembered that there's this stuff called paper and my daughters have like 74,000 markers. So I was like, I grabbed a box of their markers and I printed out this sort of comic style image of the Middleton family, which was the typical American family that Westinghouse invented. And they would appear in all the advertisements. The Middletons go to the fair. They even created a movie called The Middletons at the New York World Fair. But there was one ad that had them as like comic characters. So I took that, I printed it in color, I cut it out, I put We the Dead, I glued it another piece of paper, We the Dead, Brian Michael Murphy, um, and I basically cut them off at the waist, and then I took the markers and I like redrew the bottom half of their bodies, but at some point I made it like sort of like become like, the, sh like shredded and like these cords and stuff coming out of it, almost like they were like these data zombie wraiths or something that had been like sh shredded halfway up. Um, and so I gave that to my editor and he's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to have a real professional handle this. But, um, <laughs> but, but that real professional is really great. Um, he took that source image and he clarified and cleaned it up. And uh, he basically came up with what you saw. I mean, um, the first draft, I, the font was a little too playful. So I said that needs to be like more angular or something. There were a couple things in terms of depth that like little things I had him adjust. And then it was done. So. You know, he 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 took he took my idea and uh, you know made it a book cover because what I had was not a book cover. <laughs> Thank you, Brian.